Okay. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? All right. Um, so it's a, hi everybody, it's a real honor to welcome Sharon Marcus to the School for Criticism and Theory. Um, and I know I and everybody else is looking forward to her presentation, which is on the role of imitation in what she calls the drama of celebrity. Um, we were super lucky in my class, in my seminar, to have Sharon there yesterday, where she helped us work through some questions of method, scale, and ethics in Lukacs and Auerbach. Um, now, yesterday wasn't my first chance to spend some time in a classroom with Sharon. This is a little excerpt from a class we taught in 2003. We co-taught a PhD seminar called Reading Practices in Literary Studies, um, which met back and forth between Penn and Columbia, included students from both, both places. Um, now, I have a longstanding interest in radical pedagogy and what's sometimes called unteaching. So, for instance, Ranciere in The Ignorant Schoolmaster critiques what he calls the pedagogical myth that divides the world into an inferior intelligence and a superior one. Ranciere argues, explication is not necessary to re remedy an incapacity to understand. On the contrary, that very incapacity provides the structuring fiction of the explicative conception of the world. It's the explicator who needs the incapable and not the other way around. It is he who constitutes the incapable as such. So Sharon and I took this class as an opportunity to quite literally teach what we did not know, which is Ranciere's recommendation. Um, that was reading methods in digital humanities. So you can see there was a kind of practical workshop component to this, um, which gave us a chance to inhabit the space of the incapable as such. This experience brought us both up against the limits of our competency, and honestly, this is not that easy a thing to do in Sharon's case. I can think of few better companions for this kind of intellectual adventure, that's Ranciere's phrase, than Sharon Marcus. Sharon's deep curiosity, her restless intelligence, her great talent for taking interest in the world, and her ability to grasp and parse disparate bodies of knowledge, these are the qualities that make thinking alongside her such a pleasure. Also, I spent a lot of time just trying to keep up. That's another one of those impossible tasks, all the more fun for being impossible. I've been fortunate to collaborate with Sharon on a couple projects um, in recent years. In 2015, along with Stephen Best, we organized a conference at the Heyman Center for the Humanities at Columbia called Description Across Disciplines. Um, and the way we conceived this is that we asked scholars, writers, and artists to talk about what description looks like in their fields or in their practice. We also asked them to perform an example of description. So uh, we published the results of this uh, conference in a special issue of representations, this one. Um, and the project offered me a chance to co-write with Sharon and Stephen and also to see Sharon's unparalleled skill skills as an editor. And the conference, I think, also for me was an example of Sharon's um, tremendous intellectual generosity. So I'd, when we did this conference, I'd been working on description for several years, and the fact that we organized the conference and the journal issue around this keyword was super helpful in moving my own thinking forward. Over the past several years, Sharon's begun to cross more and more between academic and public intellectual worlds. In 2012, um, Sharon, along with the anthropologist Caitlin Zaloom, founded Public Books. And I took this screenshot of the Public Books homepage this morning, which I think already just gives you a sense of the interest of the journal. Public Books publishes reviews of books, movies, art, TV, and more, but it does a lot more than that. It aims to bring incisive analysis, timely debate, and a critical look at contemporary issues informed by historical depth to a broad audience. So uh, I've had the privilege to be edited by Sharon for Public Books and also to edit alongside her um, as she's worked to broaden the scope and audience of the journal. So those, these are the direct collaborations that I've had with Sharon over the last few years. Uh, but during these same years, she was also serving as Dean of the Humanities at Columbia. She edited the special issue of Public Culture. She finished the drama of Celebrity, which we're hearing from today, and much, much more. It was always so. 
Observing Sharon, as I've had the opportunity to do recently, has made me reflect not only on her incredible bandwidth as a scholar and thinker, but also on her awesome capacity for work. I think we tend to celebrate genius, particularly in theory and criticism, and too easily deprecate the power of work. And I think we could probably have a little gender critique now if we wanted to. Of course, there are reasons to be critical of demands for increased productivity, the uptick in administrative duties, the call to overload teaching and mentoring, and the general speed up. But it's impossible to think about Sharon's scholarship or her career without admiring her ability to throw herself with terrific energy into a wide variety of projects and to pull them off effectively, but also thoughtfully, and with great integrity. Sharon's one of those people, and this does not describe everyone we know, who puts in work whether anyone is looking or not, whether or not there are individual gains to be reaped. Without these people, I think, things would grind to a halt very quickly. We owe them a debt of gratitude, and I, in my case, since I've been the recipient of Sharon's open-handed and freely given mentorship again and again, owe her a personal debt of gratitude. Sharon has a supremely distinguished record of accomplishments, publications, and awards. Her monographs, apartment stories, city and home in 19th century Paris and London, and between women, friendship, desire, and marriage in Victorian England have a significant impact in the field of uh, 19th century studies, gender and women's studies, and literary studies more broadly. Apartment Stories engages with public sphere and feminist theory to historicize and make material the concept of privacy in the 19th century. It shows Sharon's remarkable reach, combining readings of literature and literary history with architecture, law, city planning, urban observation, and more. Between Women, Friendship, Desire, and Marriage in Victorian England also demonstrates Sharon's ability to move seamlessly between literary studies and cultural history. Reading a diverse range of materials and discourses, as well as literary texts, Between Women rewrites the history of women's intimacies in Victorian Britain. Challenging both the traditional gay and lesbian hidden from history thesis and the focus in queer studies on transgression and deviance, the book argues that intimate relations between women were central, public, and accepted in the period. Now it was in uh, Between Women that Sharon developed the concept of just reading, which I referred to in my talk on Monday called Just Watching, um, another one of those debts. This call to attend to what texts say rather than scouring their dark corners for what they do not or cannot say has had a pro profound influence on, on my own work and on the field more broadly. Sharon followed this um, um, book up with a 2009 special issue of Representations, edited with Stephen Best on service reading, and no, one's been stop, no one has stopped talking about that since then. Sharon received her BA from Brown and her PhD from Johns Hopkins. She, her first job was at Berkeley, she then moved to Columbia, where she is the Orlando Harriman Professor of English and Comparative Literature. Please welcome Sharon Marcus. Thank you, Heather, for that very generous introduction, which was a labor of collegial love, and I've been very honored to be able to work with you over the last few years. And I want to thank Hent as well, and Jim, and Paula, and everybody who's organized this, and all of you for being here. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. So, here we go. It's a little there's a little bit of a clash going on between you being able to hear me and my being able to see my talk, but I'm going to do my best. What might it mean to linger on the face value of a cultural phenomenon that is itself about the value of faces? Since the 1940s, when celebrity first became a topic of serious discussion, it has attracted suspicion from intellectuals who have condemned it either for masking nefarious depths or for masking nothing at all for being pure superficiality. In foundational and widely cited writings about celebrity by Theodore Adorno, Leo Lowenthal, Edgar Morin, Daniel Burstyn, Guy Debord, Leo Brody, David Marshall, and Chris Rogic, it has been taken as given, first, that celebrity violates the boundary separating private from public, bringing to the surface what should be kept hidden from view, a normative claim. 
Second, that celebrities lack genuine merit because they are tautologically famous, in the words of Daniel Borston, only for being famous. Third, that celebrity is an ideological mystification because the glamorous individuals we call stars are really nothing but interchangeable commodities. And fourth, most broadly, that celebrity is an act, a deception, and an illusion in need of critique and demystification. Tom Mole, in his recent work on Byron and celebrity, sums up these views when he writes that, quote, Celebrity culture functions best when consumers remain mystified by it, attributing a celebrity's success to his or her magical star quality, end quote. On the surface, this reading goes, stardom appears to be about the public's response to distinctive individuals, but if we peel away the glamorous facade, we will find the deep cause of this surface effect, which is a system that depends on destroying individuality by turning unique persons into interchangeable things. Guy Debord echoed Theodore Adorno's critiques of standardization in mass culture in sections 60 and 63 of La Société du Spectacle when he wrote that, quote, and I'll give it in translation, the agent of the spectacle placed on stage as a star is the opposite of the individual, the enemy of the individual in himself as well as in others. Even Richard Dyer, whose nuanced account of stardom acknowledged the many pleasures that celebrity culture affords, saw the film close-up with its emphasis on faces as indicative of how celebrity traffics in false illusions of intimacy with stars and promotes spurious notions of individualism. The ultimate author of stars such as Greta Garbo, he writes, is ideology. Only Roland Barthes, in his famous meditation on Garbo's face in mythologies, offers a somewhat different reading of the celebrity surface. Rather than reduce the star's face to the empty secrecy of a mask that in fact hides nothing, Bart equated Garbo's blankness with the plenitude of an ideal essence. With the exception of Bart's, all of these accounts see celebrities and fans alike as lacking the agency associated with skeptical critical thinking. And of all the actions associated with celebrities and fandom, and the book I've been finishing on celebrity encompasses celebrities, fans, and the media, the action that seems most obviously to lack agency is imitation. Theorists tend to view the phenomenon of stars imitating other stars as evidence of the interchangeability that so offended Adorno, and journalists and theorists alike tend to view fans who imitate their favorite icons as evidence of the stupidity of public's enthrall to celebrity culture, as in this lightly mocking article from a 1964 issue of Life magazine, which reported that British boys were paying $1.85 for a Beatles haircut, expensive at the time, and that 20,000 Beatles wigs had been sold, including at the very top left corner to J. Paul Getty, who wore one to a party. One public schoolboy, the article reported, threatened with expulsion if he adopted a bowl cut, chose expulsion. It's easy to view those, it's okay to laugh, <laughs> it's easy to view those who pattern themselves on celebrities as having surrendered their freedom and individuality, their agency, to the hypnotic effects of mass culture. Commenting on what he called mimesis in mass culture, Adorno argued that even the most spontaneous seeming gestures do not express true pleasure. Writing about people dancing to jazz music, he commented that, quote, the behavior of the victims recalls St. Vitus's dance or the motor reflex spasms of the maimed animal. What Adorno considered, in his words, forcibly produced imitations looked to him more like injury, disease, and death than like what he opposed them to, which again, quoting, was self-expression and individuality. Others have argued, and I'm thinking here primarily of the work of Henry Jenkins, that celebrity imitation can serve more useful and happy purposes in constructing a sense of self. Before Jenkins wrote, there was the work of feminist film critics, including in the early 1990s, film scholar Jackie Stacy, whose pioneering work challenged the characterization of female film spectators as passive by eliciting British women's memories of viewing Hollywood films in the 1940s and 1950s. 
through, in fact, a survey. So there's some resonances with some of the work that Heather has been studying. Stacy argued that ordinary women saw female stars as representing a glamour and abundance that offered a temporary respite from wartime austerity. Identification did not always express itself as imitation, but Stacy quotes many instances when it did. The women she surveyed in 1989 recalled copying hats, shoes, hairstyles, and eyebrows seen in films, brushing their hair to look like Betty Davis's in Dark Victory, or buying a suit after seeing Marilyn Monroe wear one in Niagara. So sociologists studying responses to Princess Diana's death in 1997 found that many people explicitly, that is self-consciously, saying this is what I'm doing, turned to celebrity biography to glean solutions to common problems. Post-game interviews with athletes similarly illustrate how to voice winning and losing, satisfaction and disappointment. Like the deportment and elocution manual so popular before the rise of radio and television, media coverage of celebrities offers the general public guidelines for how to be in the world. These two positions, Adorno's mimesis as disease, Stacy's imitation as self-fashioning, assign very different values to imitation, but both assume that copying comes easily. Adorno considered imitation an unavoidable reflex. Many others similarly theorize popular culture as exerting an irresistible, contagious force that makes it impossible not to mimic it. And even studies by Stacy and Jenkins, who emphasize the agency of fans, tend to assume that anyone who wants to imitate a celebrity is free to do so without encountering obstacles or attracting censure. What, however, if celebrity imitation is not automatic and effortless, but a choice and a skill? And what if, far from being open to all or imposed on ordinary people as a way to keep them down, celebrity imitation is a privilege that members of dominant groups often seek to deny to those insubordinate ones? Not insubordinate, but those in subordinated groups. An anecdote about the novelist Henry James illustrates just how deliberate, difficult, and exclusionary celebrity imitation can be. Given James's high standards and elevated style, he may seem an unlikely candidate for fanboy, but he began his career in the 1870s as a theater reviewer and continued for many decades to publish essays about playwrights and actors. Despite his interest in drama and performance, James strongly criticized modern celebrity culture in works such as the Aspern Papers and the Death of a Lion, which showcase the dangers of paying more attention to the private lives of artists than to their work. As a drama critic covering the Paris theater scene in the 1870s, James had singled out French actress Sarah Bernhardt for praise early in her career. Born in 1844, Sorry, can people still hear me? Because this dropped down a bit, okay. Born in 1844, Bernhardt had a distinguished career in Paris during the late 1860s and throughout the 1870s, where she was something of a local star, a local phenomenon. In 1879, she became an international celebrity, and until her death in 1923, remained one of the most famous women and the most famous French woman in the world. James, however, disapproved of Bernhardt's willingness to be known for her offstage personality as well as for her onstage performances. In 1879, though he championed her when she was somewhat of a niche celebrity in Paris, but in 1879, when she became a runaway success while performing in London, he wrote an essay cuttingly rebuking her for becoming, quote, a celebrity pure and simple, thanks to what he dismissively called her advertising genius. Much as James disapproved of Bernhardt's publicity-seeking ways, he continued to admire her acting, as we learn from the diaries of Alice Comins Carr, a theater costume designer married to a drama critic and theater manager. In a rarely cited passage from her rarely cited reminiscences published in 1926, Carr recalled how decades earlier, James had entertained the daughters of punch cartoonist Georges du Maurier by attempting to replicate Bernhardt's famous glide through a doorway as Tosca, a role that she premiered in London in 1888. Um, if you know the opera, and it, 
remains familiar in a lot of the stage business in the opera is what Bernhardt developed when performing the non-operatic role at the end of the act in which she has to kill Scarpia. Tosca has to sort of very quietly go out the door and there's a very, it was a very famous bit of stage business. A lot of people would spend paragraphs trying to describe it. She seemed to sort of move through the door piece by piece, but yet in a somehow fluid manner. So here is Carr describing James reacting to that performance and that bit of stage business. Henry James had a very critical appreciation of dramatic impersonation, and he often amused the Du Maurier girls by his imitation of theatrical celebrities. He had just come from seeing Sarah Bernhard in Tosca and undertook to give a, quote, representation of the great actress, end quote. That's the end of James being quoted, but this is still Carr writing. But when he came to the point where he had to squeeze himself through a crack in the door, Henry James forgot that he was not so slim as the divine Sarah, and his plump figure stuck halfway. For years after, Carr adds, the girls would tease James by asking him to please be Sarah. As this anecdote illustrates, imitation is not easy. James tries to slip into a star's skin, only to find himself flailing in a doorway. Much as he admired actors, in this instance, he could not translate his critical appreciation of one actor's work into an equally skilled performance of his own. The crack in the doorway that he fails to squeeze through is small, but the gap it exposes between his dramatic talent and Bernhardt's is wide. Nor did James himself consider imitation a heedless, involuntary reflex. In saying that he would give a representation of the great actress, James used a term that meant both an actor's interpretation of a role and an author's creation of a text. Representations frame the world, deciding what is worth including or excluding, and thus imply an ambition to do more than merely copy reality. By offering to give his own representation of Bernhardt's famous glide through a doorway in Tosca, James implied that his imitation would deploy, all of his, would deploy all of his considerable artistic acumen. If his representation fell short, it was not for lack of intentional effort. Finally, this anecdote illustrates one way that imitation is not equally open to all. There's more than a hint of gay shaming in Carr's account of young women ridiculing an older man for so enthusiastically trying to imitate a female celebrity and failing. As a novelist, James prided himself on his self-consciousness and keen observation, famously counseling novice writers to try to be people on whom nothing is lost. How embarrassing, Carr implies, for the master to get caught in the act of forgetting the difference between his plump body and the divine Sarah's slim one. Try as he might, Henry could not be Sarah, although his botched imitation did achieve the highly theatrical goal of drawing attention to himself. James was no ordinary imitator, and his attempt to copy a celebrity failed in part because he ambitiously tried to reproduce an extraordinarily demanding piece of stage business. Most people who imitate celebrities content themselves with repeating catchphrases, buying products, or adopting looks associated with their favorite stars. The consumer revolution of the 18th century had made it easier to copy the clothes that celebrated actors wear. While the 19th century commercialization of cheap lithographs and small format photographs, often featuring renowned figures of the day, made it much easier to imitate celebrities. Industrial modernity also brought with it an increased sense that bodies could and should be transformed for the better through what historian Michael Anton Budd has called the drive to sculpt the physical self. By the 1880s, journalists were reporting that Sarah Bernhardt's smallest gestures were noted, copied, exaggerated by a multitude of idolatrous women. That's a quote from an article. What were Bernhardt's celebrity imitators trying to achieve? The mostly male authors who published their observations of Bernhardt's mostly female imitators saw those women as seeking to emulate Bernhardt's eccentricity, originality, defiance, and will, as well as the seductiveness and emotional intensity that characterized her signature roles. Many who aspired to imitate the star contented themselves with purchasing products associated with her. 
Although the celebrity endorsement business has developed exponentially in the last several decades, the practice of using celebrities to advertise goods has existed for at least 200 years. Carriage manufacturers named Phaetons and Surreys after Sarah Bernhardt because she represented energy and speed, while an exhibitor of a Bernhardt pelargonium, a flower, saw women and flower, woman and flower as sharing a vivid elegance. And in most of these cases, these endorsements were happening without the star's permission, and there wasn't really a legal framework for stars to protest, but there were also arrangements that stars made to endorse products, and you'll see an example of one later in the talk. In the 19th century, many copied how the clothes that stars wore on stage and in the studio photographs displayed for sale in shop windows on almost every city street. Like modern celebrity, modern fashion involved creating patterns types and models, and distributing them to ever-growing numbers of people over increasingly large distances and at an increasingly fast pace. Theater and fashion had especially close connections in the 19th and early 20th centuries. As theater historian Marlis Sch Schweitzer has shown, many women went to the theater primarily to observe and replicate the latest styles. Commenting in 1882 on the social influence of the typical Parisian actress, a journalist observed that, quote, the most virtuous of women studies the actress, learns her by heart, copies her outfits, her postures, her manners, her eccentricities. This was certainly the case with Sarah Bernhardt. When Bernhardt toured provincial France in 1880, Le Figaro reported on how interested their female readers, lectrices, were in her costumes and described somewhat fancifully how, quote, even in churches, young girls dream of Sarah Bernhardt's outfits between Bible verses. Bernhardt's sartorial influence extended to England, where one could buy a Bernhardt costume at a French dressmaker's in Covent Garden, and British fashion magazines advertised Bernhardt gloves, bonnets, dresses, bodices, corsages, blouses, perfume hairstyles, and hair dye. One magazine advised a reader to copy the Sarah Bernhardt toilette in this journal, while another directed a reader from as far away as South Africa on how to make a Sarah Bernhardt ruffle depicted in a plate that had appeared in a previous issue. While journalists writing for the women's press focused on the intelligence Bernhardt exercised when inventing new fashions, those writing for humor and sports publications with primarily male readerships focused on ridiculing the women who tried to imitate her. Writing for readers who, male readers who defined themselves against any markedly feminine pursuit those reporters saw the women who copied Bernhardt dresses, bonnets, and hairstyles as the sartorial equivalents of Henry James wedged in a doorway. Their attempts to reproduce the star's distinctive look only showed up their failure to achieve it. An 1890, 1892 review by an avowedly captious critic of Bernhardt's Cleopatra, writing in the Illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News, noted that even in June, a month when most playhouses were deserted, Quote, it is still the fashion apparently to have seen Bernhardt, and as in matters of fashion the fair sex takes the lead, there has been quite a rush of ladies to Cleopatra. Nine out of ten women whom we saw in the vestibule had evidently made up after the familiar portraits of the actress, especially in arrangement of the hair. For this commentator, Bernhardt's glamour as the queen of the Nile, famous for her powers of seduction, becomes tarnished first by her age, and second when mirrored by her less appealing followers who transform her rarity into something more common. Some journalists mocked celebrity imitation by imagining it taken to comic extremes. A cartoon in an 1883 issue of Funny Folks, another comic journal with probably a mixed readership but definitely leaning more towards a masculine projected audience, showed a woman with gloves so long that they need to be held up by her maid. A man in top hat and monocle standing in for the supercilious male reader observes the scene. The caption reads, the gloves worn by Sarah Bernhardt and Fedora were four and a half feet long. Aristocratic lady amateur. Well, Mr. Spangler, I may not be so good an actress as Sarah Bernhardt, but my gloves are six inches longer. The gloves caricatured here were indeed world famous. Even the Rocky Mountain News reported on them. 
the cartoon aims to deflate them, literally and figuratively, by exaggerating them even further. The glove fabric that would have been tightly compacted on Bernhardt's arm appears here stretched and sagging to the point of formlessness. The cartoon parses imitation not as helpless mimicry, but as a form of risible competition. Unable to improve on Bernhardt's acting, the aristocratic amateur boasts of exceeding the star's already excessive glove length. The cartoon's chief target is the vanity of a copycat who boasts of outdoing Bernhardt, but has failed even to equal her. But it also pokes deadpan fun at Bernhardt's extravagance in wearing gloves four and a half feet long, suggesting that imitation belittles both the imitator and the model imitated. Women's fashion magazines encouraged readers to imitate how celebrities dressed and the traits their styles expressed. By contrast, men's magazines challenged both the idea that fashion might embody a celebrity's essence and the possibility that ordinary women might succeed at imitating stars. Monica Miller has shown that for several centuries, caricaturists have belittled African Americans who exercised agency by dressing up. 19th century male satirists ridiculed women who expressed aspirations for independence and public attention by identifying with or imitating Bernhardt. An 1891 Russian burlesque entitled Sarah Bernhardt, or Loge No. 2 in the Dress Circle, spoofed a variety of women attempting to imitate the international celebrity known for her eccentric personality. When a husband forbids his wife from going out to see the actress, she retorts, a la Bernhardt, I'll do whatever I want. One character takes up painting after discovering that, quote, Sarah Bernhardt's artistic temperament is like mine. Others imagine that, like Bernhardt, they will become the focus of public attention. During the intermission, they won't be able to take their binoculars off me, says one woman. Me neither, echoes another, who later in the play walks on stage, moving dramatically to ask the audience, don't you think I look remarkably like Sarah Bernhardt? Not only is the answer no, the very question exposes how little her self-knowledge matches her self-regard. <laughs> Satires like these posit both imitation and imitability as a privilege denied to the majority of women. From one vantage point, such caricatures seem designed to correct unseemly self-regard and excessive accumulations of status, a long-standing function of all kinds of humor. From another, however, they seem intent on mocking anyone who dares to rise above her appointed station. As commoners who had risen in the ranks, most celebrities, became, but that was the case for most celebrities in the 19th century, celebrities became ideals for those aspiring upward and targets for those who wanted to limit social mobility. Though the group that most parodists poked fun at for getting above themselves by imitating Bernhardt was white women, a small but significant number presented celebrity imitation as a racial privilege confined to white people. In a catch-22 typical of racism's double binds, cartoonists depicted members of non-white groups as abject whether they succeeded in imitating white celebrities or failed. Consider this 1881 advertisement for La Diaphane, a rice powder endorsed by Bernhardt, in, in this case, officially endorsed by her. Um, and I should warn you that this image contains, as do two other images I will discuss later in this talk, racist text and imagery. Designed to take up an entire page, this busy image consists of four corner panels that from top left to bottom right purport to tell the story first of Bernhardt's departure from France when she did a tour of the United States, then next in upper right, her arrival in New York's harbor, which was widely reported on because Customs was very impressed with how many trunks of clothes she bought, and there was a very heated debate about whether they were work tools or needed to be taxed as imports. Then at the bottom left, the dispersal of her name throughout Europe, and at bottom right, her popularity in even the remotest areas of the world. The image associates the celebrity with the product advertised, a powder, in two metonymic ways. It suggests that the powder has actually touched the star's skin, and it offers at bottom center a facsimile of Bernhardt's practically illegible handwriting. Since we cannot actually read this testimonial to the powder's wonders, its main purpose is to make us feel closer to the star's body by offering an image of writing 
purportedly produced by her own hand. It actually, I've seen letters of Bernhardt's and it does look like her handwriting and her illegible handwriting was a stroke of genius because people would send her a telegram saying, can I come see you tomorrow at 2 p.m.? And she'd send back a completely illegible response. And so they showed up and she wasn't there. Well, she had never turned them down. So the ad also presents the celebrity and the good for sale as metaphors for each other. La Diafan refers both to the powder, it's a brand name, and to Bernhardt herself. Both are, at least at this stage in Bernhardt's life, delicate and filmy. Both move quickly. The caption to the panel at the bottom left explains that Bernhardt's fame moved through Europe like a train of powder. Of course, they mean gunpowder, but the play on words with the product advertised is deliberate. Both maintain their freshness even when traveling around the world. Both are aesthetic, aristocratic, and grand as signified by various emblems, including the circular medallion at the bottom of the frame in the center, which contains the quasi-aristocratic motto that Bernhardt devised for herself, quand même, which means in, uh, in spite of everything. Or it, it could sort of be translated, nevertheless, she persisted. And many actors I have found devised these emblems for themselves. Henry Irving did, the, um, Mrs. Leslie Carter in the United States did. It wasn't unique to Bernhardt to do this. Perhaps most importantly, but also most ambiguously, both the powder and the performer are white. Celebrity endorsements typically invite, even demand, identification and imitation. Thousands of ads like this one have suggested that by purchasing products associated with stars, consumers can become more like them. It is therefore striking that two of the vignettes in this ad block the imitative impulse. At top left, the image of a grotesquely magnified Bernhardt with an equally huge powder box invites the viewer to perceive the reputation of the product's celebrity endorser as unjustifiably inflated. This is the visual grammar of caricature, not of idealization. And at bottom right, in a vignette whose caption suggests that though many are called to imitate Bernhardt, not all succeed in doing so, we see two female figures with faces shaded so darkly that we can barely see their features. The caption reads in translation, and, and the French is attempting to emulate something that it seems to think is Creole or Pigeon. In America, the enthusiasm is general. What you doing there? Me put on Sarah Bernhardt powder. Me no longer want to be poorly whitened. The use of the present tense suggests that one of the figures is meant to be represented in the act of applying the powder, but both figures' faces are so darkly shaded that it is difficult to discern their features, which encourages the viewer to doubt the powder's effectiveness as a whitening agent. The caption suggests that imitation of Bernhardt has become so general, it begins, the enthusiasm is so general, so common that it has spread to those whom the cartoonist considers the lowest members of society. To be sure, the image also gestures towards the exotic allure often attributed to both Bernhardt and to African American women in the 19th century. But image and caption both find ways to establish the black figure's subordinate position in a racial hierarchy. By presenting one of the black figures as wanting to correct her poorly whitened, mal blanchi skin, the caption presents whiteness as both norm and ideal. By, be by depicting one of the women in a gracelessly contorted pose that may be meant to suggest a poor attempt at imitating one of Bernhardt's famous onstage gestures, the image associates blackness with the savage and grotesque. Minstrel shows often did the same when claiming to imitate black movement in speech, and the contorted posture of the woman on the left closely resembles images of the famous Jump Jim Crow dance that white actors performed while wearing blackface, and performed around the world so it would have been familiar to people in France. By presenting the two black female figures in dresses whose short sleeves and skirts expose their arms, ankles, and feet, the image associates them with an abject poverty, impossibly distant from the delicate, filmy beauty associated with the advertised rice powder. Compare their faces, poses, and garb 
let's go back, to the idealized renderings of genteel white women at bottom left whose elaborately tailored dresses have high necks and long skirts and who appear surrounded by elements of modern urban infrastructure such as sandwich boards and street lights. The fashionable white women occupy the same space as Bernhardt. At top right, they wait to see her disembark. At bottom left, they read an ad for one of her public appearances. By contrast, the black figures appear in an isolated, vaguely tropical setting far from the realms of fashionable urbanity. Their exposed dark forms reverse the long white gloves Bernhardt wears in the ad's central image. They know Bernhardt only through the powder named after her, making the links between the celebrity and these imitators as flimsy as the powder's ability to whiten their dark skins. The bizarre self-contradiction of this advertisement replicates a tension within celebrity and consumer culture between egalitarianism, the promise that anyone can be a star or at least powder up like one, and exclusion. Some people can never rise above their appointed stations. The vignettes at top left and bottom right defy a fundamental principle of advertising to claim miraculous powers for their products and their endorsers. The top image undercuts the celebrity, the one of Bernhardt with the big head, undercuts the celebrity's grandeur by inflating it beyond credibility, while the bottom image mocks a consumer for believing that the advertised product might work. Tellingly, both vignettes also spoof the product itself by exaggerating the size of the round powder box that looms large at the top left and bottom, co- bottom corners. You can sort of see there the scale, anchoring the entire composition. Advertising touts glamour, but also risks cheapening it by expanding its purview to anyone who can afford a box of rice powder. Celebrity elevates stars by making them known to multitudes, but by definition, those multitudes will include society's least prestigious groups. The black women who inflate Bernhardt also debase her, and caricature seeks to put both imitator and imitated in their proper places. Taken as a whole, the advertisement for La Diafan seems designed not only to sell a commodity, I'll just go back to the whole thing again, but also to assure the middle class white women it targets as its chosen addressees that celebrity status and imitation will not overcome hierarchies of class and caste. The sardonic image of the oversized Bernhardt implies that no matter how glamorous and successful she has become, she would never, as an illegitimate unmarried woman who worked for a living, possess the ease, grace, and respect enjoyed by women of leisure, firmly attached to husbands and fathers. The image of the black women too dark to be lightened by the powder similarly conveys that while everybody wants to use the advertised good, not everybody can. The attempt to imitate celebrities may be universal, but only those at the top of the racial hierarchy are allowed to be seen successfully copying the stars. Celebrity and commodity culture work by appealing to large numbers of people who hunger for status and distinction. One common critique is that both do so in ways that foster illusions about capitalism fostering equality for all. This advertisement, however, makes no effort to reconcile that contradiction between elitism and populism. Instead, it blatantly seeks to limit celebrity culture's leveling energies. Another set of images from the 1880s, great time, the 1880s. These from the United States similarly mocks low status ethnic groups who seek to elevate themselves by imitating a celebrity. The first shown here presents a series of ethnic Oscar Wildes. These images depend on a coarse racism that exaggerates features considered typical of each respective group. The Jewish Oscar has the long nose and high cheekbones, also visible in 19th century caricatures of Sarah Bernhardt and British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, Disraeli, as well as in George Cruikshank's illustrations of Fagin and Oliver Twist. The African-American Oscar has spiky hair, exaggeratedly full lips, and like the women in the rice powder ad, exposed legs and bare feet. The German Oscar wears lederhosen and drinks beer from a stein that doubles as a vase for a lily, the flower associated with the aesthetic Oscar Wilde. The Asian American Oscar has sallow skin, a pigtail, and a long mustache. The Irish Oscar at top left illustrates how celebrity offers a path to upward mobility, however limited, that caricaturists seek to block entirely 
Wilde was himself Irish, but the coarse features and fancy dress of the Irish Wilde in this cartoon are intended to show up the real Oscar's pretensions in trying to rise above his station and to demonstrate the imp impossibility of masses of Irishmen following his suit. The humor here, such as it is, depends on mingling the rarefied with the base, the lily and the sunflower with a pig, a mug, and a jar labeled for sale. We are asked to laugh at the distance between the celebrity and the abject ethnic groups who strive and fail to imitate him. Imitation only widens the gulf between Wilde's effete interest in beautifying everyday life, he was touring the United States at this time giving a lectures on the house beautiful, and the Jews' venal commercialism. Wilde's fancy dress and the ragged state of the barefoot and pantless African American offer another contrast as does his aestheticism and the Asian's utterly foreign garb, decor, and music. For this cartoonist, a Jew or Irishman who tries to mimic Wilde's aestheticism succeeds only in accentuating his distance from it. Even as these images play on the difference between the white Wilde and his ethnic others, they also lower Wilde to his imitator's level. The cartoons point, and these cartoons were um, by Courier and Ives and were circulated very widely. They were very popular. The cartoons point is not simply that a Jewish or black Wilde would be ridiculous, but that Wilde himself is ridiculous with his long hair, extravagant costumes, and interest in home decor. Cartoonists also leveled their ridicule at the possibility that imitating Wilde might be a way for ethnic and racial groups to claim a visibility at odds with the desire of dominant classes to keep them out of sight, quietly serving others for little or no pay. Consider this image spoofing the contagious effects of Wilde's dandyism during his 1881 to 1882 U.S. tour. Here again, a cartoonist derides an African-American figure for attempting to imitate a white celebrity. The dandy in the foreground of this image has caught the aesthetic craze, which provides the title for the cartoon. His imitation is imperfect. His yellow pants have ragged hems, and a large feather threatens to overwhelm his too small hat. But his finery does differentiate him from the black women on either side of him who wear drab worn clothing and whose bared arms, there they are again, signify their engagement in manual labor. The younger woman in the background wears an apron, which suggests that she works as a cook, while the older woman closer to the foreground is actively engaged in washing, a job that maintains the finery of those who can afford to keep their clothes as spotless as the white shirt visible in the laundry basket at bottom left. The cruel joke of the cartoon is that a figure who should know his place in a realm of harsh necessity has dared to make himself purely aesthetic by wearing delicate finery in a workyard and by putting a utilitarian laundry basin into a vase for an ornamental sunflower. Something just happened to the uh, mic. I'm going to stand a little farther back. Making the dandy look so different from the women in the image marks his social transgression as individual, even idiosyncratic, unrepresentative of his race. I think that's one of the reasons there are two women rather than just one. The skeptical commentary attributed to the older female figure in the caption highlights the dandy's strangeness in dialect itself marked as deviating from white speech and normal spelling. And I'll read it because you probably can't see it. It says, what's the matter with the nigga? Why Oscar use gone wild? Exclamation point. That comment presents a black man daring to imitate a white celebrity as wild, engaged in an isolated and savage bid for freedom that inevitably fails. At the same time, the pun on wild and the fact that the young black man is also named Oscar suggests that imitating wild does effectively, if absurdly, differentiate the dandy from other black men. Wilde appears here as a potential resource for commoners wishing to assert their freedom from social norms and constraints. Although the cartoon reinforces the notion that copying celebrities is a racial privilege not available to African Americans, the adoring gaze of the young woman in the background provides this failed imitation of Wilde with at least one appreciative spectator. Her presence suggests that although Wilde and his imitators were usually perceived as defying normal masculinity, their fancy dress might have attracted women who both desired and identified with dandies. 
even as the caption dismisses the African-American Oscar's pretensions as a bemusing form of wildness in need of cure or quarantine, it suggests that Oscar Wilde and others like him could inspire ordinary members of the public to dissolve old social bonds and form new ones. While journalists and cartoonists used ridicule to discourage ordinary women from imitating female stars, and even advertisers set racial limits on who could emulate white celebrities, white 19th century audiences applauded and rewarded white men who imitated women and African Americans. Minstrel acts popular around the world well into the 1920s featured, and beyond, <laughs> featured white performers in blackface makeup who pretended to dance, sing, speak, and dress like cartoonish distortions of black people. Scholar Eric Lott has called minstrelsy an affair of copies and originals and noted the affinities between cartoonists and minstrel performers, both of whom exaggerated easily recognized traits and types. Not actual traits, but developed traits that could then circulate almost as memes. In some cases, minstrels were white people claiming to imitate black people imitating white people. The recurring character Zip Coon, for example, represented a black dandy whose pretensions to gentility inevitably ended in malapropism and mayhem. Many minstrel troops also parodied high art performers such as opera singer Jenny Lind, tragedian Tommaso Salvini, and Sarah Bernhardt who became the subject of several minstrel performances after her first tour of the United States in 1881. Minstrel performers in 19th century United States tended to do two kinds of female impersonation. In the first type of act, slender white men donned elegant fashions in order to impersonate female celebrities or coquettish light-skinned African-American beauties with haughty and delicate manners. White male performers like the only Leon, that was his name, capital O, capital L, the only Leon, who impersonated Sarah Bernhardt throughout his career, did not always use blackface makeup in their refined depictions of elegant women in fancy dress. During the period when Oscar Wilde lectured across the United States, Leon also performed as Miss Patient Wilde, a lover of sunflowers and lilies, whose first name evoked the Gilbert and Sullivan operetta Patience, which included a character based on Wilde. In the second, more buffoonish type of act, known as a wench act, a white man blacked up and put on a coarse dress and headwear to impersonate a large and ungainly African-American woman whose dimensions and demeanor made any conventionally feminine behavior on her part seem absurd, particularly in the many skits that depicted such women, quote, awkwardly aping their betters. That's a quote from a review of a minstrel act in the 19th century. The Bernhardt minstrel acts popular in the early 1880s favored the second type of impersonation. They transformed Sarah Bernhardt into Sarah Hartburn and Sarah Barnyard and converted the high tragedy of Camille, one of her signature roles, into the low farce of Calmiel or, so the play Camille was often billed as Camille or the fate of a coquette, the minstrel act turned that into Camille or the fate of a croquette. As this wordy playbill explains, and again, you probably can't read the fine print, so I'm not going to read all of it, but I'll read you parts of it. Sarah Barnyard transforms the flighty coquette who sacrifices all for love and dies of consumption on stage. This is the basis for the opera La Traviata, which is now the more familiar form of this story, into a croquette, a heavy piece of fried dough, quote, solid enough to depend on. Advertisements for a different parody entitled Sarah Hartburn plug the fashionable accessories coveted by Bernhardt fans. The promotion campaign when the act first opened in Philadelphia included a wagon that drove around town filled with trunks and boxes labeled Hartburn's laces, gloves, etc. And that was riffing off the news items about all the trunks of costumes Bernhardt had brought to New York and had been stopped at by custom, had, and customs had tried to stop them from coming in the country. Minstrel spoofs of Bernhardt became international hits, frequently performed throughout the United States and in London throughout the 1880s. One Ohio newspaper described an 1887 performance of William, William Henry Rice's, quote, original creation of Sarah Hartburn as popular enough to have the theater turning people away at the door. And while there's a certain amount of exaggeration in that, it was making enough money that it remained in Rice's repertory for close to 30 years. 
I, could, I won't bore you with the economics of 19th century theater, but nobody kept producing a show that didn't make money for them. By 1896, Camille had morphed into Clam Eel. By 1911, Sarah Barnyard and Sarah Hartburn had merged, and the act's subtitle had evolved into The Fate of a Chicken Croquette. Minstrel troops often timed their performances of these parodies to coincide with actual Bernhardt performances in the same cities. In June 1881, for example, Rice performed Sarah Hartburn in London's St. James's Hall at the same time that Bernhardt performed Camille in French, because she always performed exclusively in French, at London's Gaiety Theatre. A painstaking review of Sarah Hartburn ascribed its appeal to popular interest in comparing pseudo-black copies with white originals. And I'm going to read a fairly long quote. Numbers have seen, and this is a British review of this British performance of Sarah Hartburn. Numbers have seen the, quote, great white Sarah, as the Americans call her, and nothing could be more natural than to compare the great black Sarah with the original. Somewhat humorously, the critic then goes on to underscore the difference between the two versions. We are sorry we cannot pay Mr. Rice the compliment of calling his sketch a, a caricature of Mademoiselle Bernhardt. Save in a few peculiarities of manner, it is curiously unlike the original. Rather than a genuine imitation of Bernhardt, the reviewer continues, the minstrel is, quote, merely a grotesque artiste a performer who stumbles about in a very awkward fashion and falls over his long skirts, which the original artiste manages with such cleverness. Theater goers hear a performer shout in a husky voice and mix up references to the topical absurdities of the day when it is to her exquisite elocution and her silvery tones that Mademoiselle Bernhardt owes so much of her fascinating power. They see the burlesque representative drinking water out of a pail and telling the attendant who brings a chair to sling it round the other way. They observe the mock Camille presenting the lover with a lettuce as a token of her affection and receiving in return a bottle of Zoodone, which was a soft drink of the day. They watch the imitator of Mademoiselle Bernhardt smear off the burnt cork in order to present a ghastly face, half black and half white, for the grotesque death scene. The journalist's indignation, though gallant and certainly well-founded, suggests a lack of familiarity with the conventions of minstrelsy, whose very point was to give white men a platform for highlighting that blacks were and always would be the opposite of whites. Where the white Bernhardt was graceful, the black-faced Bernhardt is clumsy. Where the white Bernhardt received flowers, the black-faced Bernhardt bestows lettuces. The white Bernhardt poetically recited, the black-faced Bernhardt huskily shouts. Bernhardt was well known for twirling and falling backwards in Camille's death scene in a very difficult to replicate spiral, even more difficult to replicate than her glide through the doorway. Rice, in taking on that part of her performance, chose to dive headfirst into a divan. Everything about the minstrel performance presumes and reinforces the gulf between prestigious whiteness and lowly blackness, including its gambit that the performer's status as a white man, revealed at the very end when he smears off half his makeup, can survive his impersonation of a black woman. Celebrities make themselves available for imitation, and I'm, this is to conclude. Celebrities make themselves available for imitation by presenting themselves as distinctive types whose images and stories can be easily multiplied. The proliferation of consumer goods associated with celebrities might seem only to confirm what theories of celebrity culture have long taken as obvious, that stars are themselves commodities, objects to be bought and sold. It has also often seemed equally obvious that copying is merely a surface-to-surface -surface phenomenon, and even worse, a submissive or automatic reflex that only confirms the imitator's secondary status. 19th century satirists would not have disagreed. Yet they also presented celebrity imitation as a privilege reserved for the higher orders in which the satirists implicitly place themselves since parody is itself a form of imitation. A comic Russian play burlesque grandiose elite women inspired by Bernhardt to rebel against the husbands they are supposed to venerate and obey. Advertisers, cartoonists, and minstrel performers depicted African Americans and other low status ethnic groups mimicking Bernhardt and Oscar Wilde as trying and failing to exceed the limits placed on them. Fashion magazines presented imitation as enhancing both imitator and imitated, while caricatures often demeaned both, 
even as they emphasize the gap between celebrity models and copycat fans. But perhaps the most overt sign that imitating celebrities can benefit and bolster the imitators was how eager many white men were to restrict the pleasures of celebrity imitation to themselves. Thank you. Questions? Oh. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. So we have plenty of time for questions. Yeah. So uh, to start things off, and a caveat because I don't want this to sound prickly, but I'm really interested in hearing what you have to say. Um, I love the frame that you started with, where you point out uh, cultural criticisms, kind of downplaying, looking down on celebrity culture. So I'm wondering if you would reflect on the kind of, the, let's see, the kind of copying and emulation that happens in critical theory culture itself. Uh, not just ideas or writing styles, but at times fashion, at times attitude or persona, uh, especially as it relates to the status, say, of younger scholars or students, uh, people just starting out, and whether that has a related or a different kind of cadence to it. Mm. That didn't sound prickly at all. If you want to try again to sound more prickly. Um, I'll begin by saying that I think it's, it's not, a, I don't think this is a controversial thing to say, but imitation is kind of at the root of culture defined in the most broad terms. I mean, nobody learns how to do, you, know, you watch children, no one learns how to talk, walk, uh, Chomsky aside, there's always an element of imitation involved in learning how to be a person within a group. So I would not, I would encourage us all to be mindful when mocking imitation. And yet at the same time, of course, within the, within the content of philosophy and critical theory, imitation has long had a bad rap. Imitations are secondary. They deceive us into, you know, the, a lot of the critique that I brought up at the beginning is sort of a platonic critique of the failure of images or acts of mimesis and the need to not be lured into thinking that these are giving us access to the real thing. Perhaps because imitation is so central to what it is to be human, I think the tendency to mock imitation is also very pervasive. But I do think that the, the so there's a, f you know, in French, there's a word emulation, which means both imitation and competition. And there's a recognized sense that it would be part of joining any group that you would imitate models that would be part of how you would learn. How well you imitate those models might be how you're judged, and that there's no fault in such imitation. But there is always some, the line of when the imitation moves from being acceptable, necessary, a sign of skill, to something that is an object of mockery is always moving around and being policed. And I think within the cultures of critical theory, we're, we're no less prone, I'll say we, I don't know if I really belong to the culture of critical theory. I'm, it's not up to me to decide if that's a club I'm in. But we're no less prone to both demand imitation and sometimes censure it. I do think, I think the example you give is interesting. It does resonate with what I was talking about, which is when, you know, sometimes when very young scholars are imitating or perceived as imitating someone with a lot of status, it's always easier to mock people who are younger and lower status, but they're seen as, like, you know, are they trying to get above their station? Or the imitation seems less seamless. I can't actually think right now of like too many examples when I've seen that happen very publicly, which is a good thing. But I, I, there is sometimes in working on this project, I've wondered if the hostility of intellectuals to celebrity culture, and it's not just imitation, it's imitation, it's replication, it's many aspects of celebrity culture, is in part because we are implicated in a celebrity system ourselves, albeit a, one on a very small scale compared to 
a truly popular celebrity system, and so there's a certain discomfort there. But I, would, I wouldn't want to go too much farther in beyond speculation about that without having some actual examples and text to work with. You know, Jeff Williams edited an issue of the Minnesota Review a while back on academic celebrity, and so if you're interested in, in looking at some material that's really gone into depth about that, that might be a good place to start. Um, thank you for your talk. I have kind of a two-part question. Um, that partially goes back to Heather's introduction, which is about um, perhaps the kind of unseen or stateable labor that goes beyond, be, behind the cultivation of a celebrity image mm -hmm. and the way in which um, the kind of surface appeal of a celebrity is actually like a lot of cultivated and maybe even non-monetized labor. Mm. Um, and then the second part of that is um, the kind of way in which we, we perceive imitation as like a one-directional kind of interaction in which the like lower subject is solely the person interacting in that exchange and that there's mm -hmm. no reciprocity or kind of sense that they're in a mutual exchange, the, the kind of celebrity cultivated status and the person who's imitating them. And I'm wondering about the kind of maybe masked relations here in relationship to the commodity and, and the ability for like a third kind of status to interpolate because of, of perhaps these kind of masked relations and, and how the commodity kind of enters as a scene in which imitation becomes like public exchange. So just say a little more about what the third status would be. I followed everything except that. I, I guess I'm not saying necessarily a third status, but kind of the way in which these interactions are not visible mm -hmm. um, okay. allows for a kind of more visible commodity exchange to, to take place. So I think that there are different modes of celebrity, and some are, there are some forms of celebrity that are all about showing the creation of the celebrity the shifts in the celebrities. So certain celebrities morph a lot, you know, Madonna for decades, like part, and I don't think they're, they were necessarily, they weren't always exposing all of the work of those transformations, but they were often foregrounding that. And there's certainly in whole genres of celebrity coverage, they're like, this is how the celebrity achieves his or her look athletic skill, you know, here's the workout that they do. And then sometimes it's about making it available for imitation, like we could do that workout, we'd die if we did that workout, but you know, that's a fantasy. And sometimes they're just, here's how the celebrity puts themselves together. So some celebrities really, I think, seek out more of a seamless thing where here I am, finished product. Some move back and forth between modes. I don't think there's, um, so two, I think part of what you're asking me to do is, is um, clarify whether the examples I presented to me exhaust the modes of celebrity imitation. No. I, you know, I chose to sort of keep zeroing in on, in some ways, more and more sp specific per, like, um, permutations of the imitator imitated journalist observing the imitator and imitated relationship. So I think that would actually be a really interesting route to go to look at this whole genre of how celebrities expose their own fabrication of their star images and what that makes available for imitation and what it doesn't. And in terms of, I th so I'm, I th I think I never fully grasped the second part, so I'm having trouble recalling it. But was it about how visible this, all of this is? Well, I guess, I mean, you can disregard whatever you want. <laughs> no, I want to answer it. I just... But I think, like, uh, the, I guess what I'm most curious about is the way in which imitation is perceived as one, one direction. And in reality, I think... Oh, right, okay, yes. There's, like, a bigger relation... Yes. Absolutely, and I think that, again, some stars sometimes somewhat speciously, sometimes somewhat offensively present themselves as like a vector for bring, for imitating, you know, look, Madonna, let's take Madonna again, like she's going to claim that she's going to bring one, you know, a subculture of voguing with, yeah, like this is all deeply problematic, but it's what she claimed to do, bring a subculture of voguing by imitating it make it available to a whole other set of people, let's also call them a subculture, who weren't aware of it. So I do think that a lot of stars, even ones who promote themselves as idiosyncratic, eccentric, one of a kind, do present themselves as having a certain kind of antenna for different kinds of 
popular mode, so they definitely present them. And, and Madonna always presented herself as imitating other stars. So many stars present themselves as imitators. Um, so I really want to thank you for that wonderful and very graceful talk, and I'm going to give a really awkward question in response. I was wondering um, about the difference between imitation and mimicry. And I guess specifically about um, Homi Baba's theory of colonial mimicry, because um, there's been some really interesting work done in film st studies in a slightly later period on um, women in Jamaica who were imitating or mimicking flappers from mm -hmm. 20s films in contradistinction to the missionaries who were occupying the island and trying to force a different kind of imitation. So I was wondering, I guess, both about the difference between imitation and mimicry, and also about how um, the colonial um, exportation of these models mm -hmm. fit into the, the narrative that you were telling. So I think that the account of imitation I've been offering has a lot of Debts to Homi Baba's idea of mimicry and also tracing, but especially his concept of you know not quite, not white, like the the us uh, the built-in assumptions into the colonial scene that imitation will be demanded, but will also always be found to be wanting. And in that sense, I don't. I'm using the term imitation somewhat the way he used the term mimicry. If you were to ask me, how do I see them as being different? I wouldn't turn to his use, I would, I would think more in terms of performance terms, that mimicry is a, a performance that is framed almost as a professional imitation. So the minstrels are mimicking whichever celebrities, but they have an audience, they set it out as a very careful performance, and that there's always also usually some kind of satirical intention. So that would be how I would use mimicry. It's not at all the sense that you're evoking, but I recognize and value that particular set of terms as well. Aaron, did you want to? Um, yeah, I guess I, I think this is a question, but hopefully it'll turn it by the time I'm done. So I, um, I think what I'm interested in is whether there's anything more to be said about kind of the temporality between the celebrity and the imitation. So like um, uh, building off of the question of whether it's like one direction or whether there's kind of like you mimic the celebrity and the celebrity is also like drawing on imitation to, to I don't know, change. Um, there, so what I'm thinking about is I was trying to think through some of your examples through today, and I was really stuck on kind of like social media celebrity, which a lot of times seems to be created simultaneously with its mimicry. That like, like somebody gets famous on YouTube or Vine, when that was still a thing, because other people are like immediately copying what they're doing, and it creates like certain people rise through this like simultaneity of their own product, but then also like other people mimicking it and then kind of like advertising it in that way. And that seems to be like a very different like temporality between like celebrity and mimicry than what's going on here, maybe. And so I guess that's kind of what I'm wondering about. So that's been a big question for this whole project because of course, and actually when I started this project in 2008, social media was not, especially Twitter was and Instagram were not as big, but they were starting to become quite widespread and, of course, to not only create forms of celebrity, but to advertise themselves through celebrity. So there's, a, and I talk about this in the essay I wrote about Marina Abramovich at MoMA for that issue of public culture that Heather showed the cover of, because I talked about how her performance at MoMA was actually through the reciprocity that it offered by having a famous artist sit for hours every day and make herself available for someone to sit opposite her for as long as they wanted. So a mirroring relationship. They're sitting in exactly the same chairs. She's offering contact with a celebrity. She made herself more famous. People became famous by sitting with her. And not only was the show 
made very f popular and famous through social media, but I argue it imitated the form of social media by foregrounding the simultaneous reciprocity and mutual visibility to each other of the celebrity and the fan. This is different from the 19th century because it's faster, it's more visibly co-present not only to the celebrity and the fan but to a public and there was always a public in that MoMA atrium and there's always a public on Twitter. But I think that we'd be wrong to see this as a difference in kind rather than degree for two reasons. So I've had to read a lot of history and theory of forms like the telegraph for this project because along with photography, telegraphs were really important to creating the kind of international journalism that promoted global celebrity in the 1870s and 80s. And one of these things that I read made a really good point, and I'm sorry, I apologize to the author that I can't remember his name right now, that none of these technologies, even the telegram, even Twitter, nothing is exactly immediate or exactly simultaneous. There's always a gap. It's just not one that we really, there's two things about that gap. With Twitter, I would say we don't perceive the gap. It's so fast we don't perceive it. We just perceive it if our internet connection stops working or Twitter has a momentary breakdown and that's when we realize it's not actually genuinely immediate. But we also experience it as immediate because really what we mean by immediate is so much faster than anything I remember being used to in my lifetime. So if you talk to people in the 1880s, they would have said, oh my God, Sarah Bernhardt got married and immediately the whole world knew. And by that they meant it only took a week for the news to travel literally around the world. That felt immediate because it used to take a month. So the, you know, when that quote I read where it said the young girls go to church and they're dreaming of Sarah Bernhardt's dresses, there was a lot of coverage. This was a tour she did in France before she went to the United States. And the coverage would all talk about how she, she's performing in the theater, but every shop in town, all of the windows are covered with images of Sarah Bernhardt in her dresses, and women are copying the gowns, and they're copying the gowns very quickly, the images of her are available very quickly. They're experiencing it as super fast. I won't necessarily imme say immediate because I'm not sure that that word was being used, but they're, they are not, you know, we can look back on it and say the transfer of, imita of imitation and imitability was so slow, but that was not how it was being experienced. And if you go to the 18th century, people are, you know, I can barely bring, it, bring myself to agree with people like Bob Darnton and a host of other scholars that the 18th century really had a celebrity culture because of my 19th century perspective. But when you look at the 18th century, because newspapers are new and they're traveling around on these newly paved roads, so the horses are traveling faster than they ever have, they feel that celebrity culture is out of control. It's never been like this. So, to historicize celebrity culture is to realize that we have to be careful about, say, about making these historical breaks and saying that some of these things that seem so new are radically new. It takes a lot to sort of, I think, um, just distinguish what is new and what isn't. But so to, to answer both questions, and just I said this before, but to be really clear, I think what is genuinely new now is the visibility of reciprocity. There were always fans thronging around celebrities, writing them letters, hanging around at the stage door, ha you know, but it was never so visible to the entire public that they were doing this as it is with a medium like Twitter. And they didn't have access to other fans the way social media enables. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so my first question about the book, so I'm the first one, and uh, so if I got the gist of the talk, the idea is that Sorry. Sorry. Do you, um, do you want to? Is there a mic that can go? Uh, I'll try to. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if I understood the gist of the talk, the idea is that the critique of imitation uh, is driven by, by some kind of exclusionary impulse. In part, yeah. In that in that context. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, you quoted theorists uh, and thinkers from mid 20th century, and when I think about a celebrity culture today, the reasons that have already been mentioned, it seems that there is a greater populist tendency in celebrity culture today. And so my question would be, do you feel that there is a remnant of elitism 
Mm -hmm. and celebrity culture today, even though, at least to my eyes, I know it's very hard to generalize, but it seems to be such a populistic culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I'm going to start by answering a question that you didn't actually just specifically answer, but I think you make a really good point that I'd like to address, which is the way in which the motives of the critical theorists for being suspicious of and mocking even of celebrity imitation, how much do they resemble those of the 19th century journalists and cartoonists and advertisers I was focusing on? And it's related to the question you actually did ask because I think that by and large, most of the people, certainly Adorno, what they fear is fascism. And they're not really worried about commoners getting above their station. They're worried about commoners ruining the world. So, and they had plenty of reason to do that because of what they had, not so much about what they had seen, I think, of how the Nazis used the star system, because interestingly, there's been research on this, and the Nazis were quite hostile to celebrity culture because they wanted people to identify with the race and the folk, and not with individuals. Um, but, and certainly many celebrities took a huge stand against fascism and were influential in doing so. But they're just very suspicious of mass media. They're very suspicious, suspicious of personality cults. And I think, I would say they, that some of them just go a little overboard in equating all of that with the cult, what Adorno called the cultural, culture industry. I think we can fault Hollywood for a lot, but they're, they were actually quite different, and certainly Hollywood and the stars of Hollywood are not exactly the same thing. I do think, and I am gonna get to your actual question, I do also think that a lot of these figures um, are quite loath to see stars who focus a lot on their appearance and on beauty and physicality as worthy figures of attention. So they're quite distressed that people care so much about these figures. And I think that Adorno clearly finds it absolutely unthinkable that some movie star, and male or female, would actually have agency or be capable of critical thinking. So today, is celebrity culture elitist or populist? I mean, it's kind of both, isn't it? I mean, it's a, you could say it's a populist worship of elitism welcome to capitalism. You could say that some figures really put, I mean, it's, we can generalize about celebrity culture in structural ways, but I think we have to remember that one of the structural features of celebrity culture is, as Edgar Moran, I think very effectively put it, it's a polytheistic system, not a monotheistic one. So there's a whole range of celebrities. Some of them really put the accent on they're being very special and different and they're not going to mingle with, the, with anybody and they're fancy and they have incredibly expensive houses and clothes and some of them are like, I hunt ducks and I'm an ordinary person. So I think that structurally it's a merger of elitism and populism that is quite potent for bringing together these contradictory tendencies, but that if we're looking in terms of content at any specific celebrity, you can't say, you, you have to actually look at the specific celebrity and their image and ask what are they trying to project. In the back, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question about imitating behaviors. Um, so I'm interested in this phenomenon that I've read about called lamp shaping, which is like Portlandia, for instance, will, um, so they come to itself to being about white upper middle class people who sort of are complicit in a lot of systems of oppression. And therefore, because it makes fun of itself, it gets a free pass. Mm. Um, and I'm interested in, in how certain forms of celebrity culture might teach us that behavior, because I certainly see it replicated a lot in people that I know, and I, I'm guilty of it too. Um, and I'm wondering if you can think about that a little bit. Um, um, my immediate response is just to take it as a comment rather than a question. I mean, I would say yes. That I, I think in general, there's a lot of ways that celebrity culture teaches. Te I, mean, I and I don't think this is bad. It depends on what we're being taught. So I don't think the fact of our learning from celebrity culture or imitating celebrity culture is in and of itself inimical. I mean, it goes back to the first thing I said. If we were to say that, then we're saying all imitation is bad and I don't see how we're going to learn or change or teach anything. So my response to that, I mean, it doesn't, I think any 
cultural phenomenon that becomes popular, part of that popularity is not just consumption. I, I, and this actually helps me think a little more clearly to myself about why imitation interested me. Because I think, you know, as I started out saying, it's taken as a kind of automatism that isn't associated with something critical or thoughtful. You're pointing at an example of extremely, almost overwrought self-consciousness, both in the show itself about who imitates it, who they're imitating, and then presumably in the show's audience. Is that self-consciousness going to be a positive thing or a negative thing is not something I would want to comment on outside of specific instances. Does that get it, some of what you're saying? Thank you, Jenny. That was wonderful. I have a question going back to the, um, uh, the reference to Adorno. And I remember first uh, being reminded of a passage in Minima Moralia when I read an essay by Claude Lefort, which is the, the end of immortality, where he draws on Adorno. And he makes a claim, and I just wanted to ask you what you thought about that in the historical context, that um, uh, Adorno makes the claim, and before elaborate on this, that we could somehow think of the discourse on fame in the 19th century um, uh, in terms of a secularization of the immortality uh, assumption. Mm -hmm. And uh, the example that Lefort then discusses well beyond, I think, uh, Adorno also, is uh, Victor Hugo and Chateaubriand and a whole bunch of French socialists, etc. Um, but they are interested in fame. I don't think right. celebrity so much as a as a political category um, as 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 well. Which leads to my second question, which is more of a systematic contemporary nature. So, what are the thoughts one could have about the distinction between fame um, in in politics mm -hmm. and fame in, let's say, popular? culture or social media, etc. For example. <laughs> um, is sorry, I'm just laughing. Like, th is there a distinction between those anymore? <laughs> <But> <laughs> well, this, that's right. the question. So for example. Uh, that's my phone, I apologize. You know, um, I've become deeply convinced to my own surprise of the great wisdom that was portrayed in this British television series, The Crown, mm -hmm. where uh, you know there's a lot of thinking about fame and celebrity, and uh, it all ultimately boils down to uh, a lesson that uh, Queen Elizabeth is being taught as a young woman um, by the, the provost of Cambridge about the figure, I always forget how to pronounce his name, the 19th century constitutional lawyer, Walter, Badgett. Badgett, who makes the distinction beautifully between uh, the order of the dignified and the efficient. Mm -hmm. And the dignified is the only thing that uh, Queen Elizabeth has to be worried about. And there's a deep concern, mm -hmm. which uh, may seem trivial in many respects, but uh, and deeply unmodern, but then also deeply wise, that is that the royal house, the crown, uh, which has its dignity and fame and, and quasi-immortality uh, is deeply and somehow rightfully upset about celebrity that is tied to individuality. You know, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the sister Margaret and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and what else is, is in, involved. And if there's, a, if there's a ring of truth to it, one might say, well, you know, the reason that we are so uh, in the current predicament is that somehow that distinction between the dignified and celebrity um, is, uh, is somehow increasingly blurred. I, I, mm -hmm. I want my president or the presidency to be dignified and immortal, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't like to have a, uh, a touch of individuality that, uh, no. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little sort of bibliographical response, then a counterexample response, and then sort of just give my opinion. Actually, I'll start with the counterexample thing, which is that one of the things I talk about in one of my chapters is that, uh, many of you may not remember this, it went by so quickly we blessedly may not all have noticed it, but when Obama first ran 
his, for president in 2008, McCain ran an ad accusing him of being a mere celebrity, showing him, sort of associating him with the celebrities of the moment. Britney Spears was one. I think it was pre-Kim Kardashian, so it might, he, Paris Hilton is no Democrat, but I think Paris Hilton might have been in the mix. It, celebrity is, um, despite meaning a certain degree of success, a huge degree of success and popularity, and for some people, talent, skill, and merit. It is also a, a pejorative term, and even in our celebrity crazed days, it remains a somewhat pejorative term. So in that sense, I see the line between celebrity and fame as one that relates more to, do I like the person I'm talking about, or do I dislike the person I'm talking about? Do their values align with mine, or do I consider them my opponent? Um, that, I mean, and in that sense, one of Trump's evil genius moves is to say, no, nah, I'm not going to say I'm famous. I'm a celebrity. He'll, you know, just sort of lean into the undignified move, but it makes it then impossible to tar him with the brush of the pejorative term, celebrity. Um, there's also long been a very gender distinction between celebrity and fame. Although the word fame itself used to incorporate the distinction because it, in Latin it, would, it meant both rumor and ephemeral reports, usually bad ones, and immortal, being immortal. I tend to not place too much stock in the distinction between celebrity and fame except to track it historically because as I said, I think it's just, I'd rather that we argue about who do we think is a good figure and who do we think is not a good figure. Who do we consider worthy of recognition rather than say that some people are really meriting of being called famous and others we're just going to call them celebrities. I also think that people who some people who start out as celebrities end up being famous. It's almost never the case that those who attain immortal renown were not celebrities in their lifetime. It's, you think that this happens, that people who were completely obscure in their lifetimes later become famous, but then when you go back, and we can do this now and search in newspaper databases, Profiles were being published about them. Journalists were writing about them. They were cultivating people who could increase their reputations. And so I see often fame as something that is kind of celebrity that's been put to age for a while and gotten to acquire a certain vintage. I, there is a really good literature on the distinction between celebrity and fame, much of which I think I've just made clear I would argue with in a lot of respects, but some of the really interesting work does go into more detail on the secularization of immortality. So people like Joseph Roach in It, Leo Brody in The, um, the Frenzy of Renown, Edgar Morin also, I think, have, have expanded on the, the suggestion first made in the 1940s by people like Adorno that there's a shift in the 19th century with secularization. So a lot of the energies that had been put into religion and to concepts of God, of immortality, are now shifting. And, and it's a tension, of course, because people aren't immortal the way gods are immortal. Um, I think, uh, well, the only other thing I want to say is that in addition to the series The Crown, there's the movie The Queen, which in many ways I think sets up out some of the terms that The Crown elaborates that Helen Mirren was in, which is about how Elizabeth and the royal family responded to the death of Princess Diana. So I think I would also just add the piece of media history to this, and it gets back to some of the earlier questions. As it becomes harder and harder to um, cordon, in a very dignified manner, cordon themselves off from the people, after Diana dies, the people are literally thronging the gates of Kensington Garden. The royal family has found itself required to engage with media and with people in a way that in the 1950s they could resist. And certainly that's in some ways you could see as the task and to some sense the success of Diana's sons to be able to mediate between their dignity and a fully public, you know, a life that pretends to be fully public and has lived in the public eye. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Can you hear me all right? Uh-huh. All right. Um, so I was wondering if you could say a bit more about the notion of responsibility, because I feel like
time, um, the public sort of manifests its um, acknowledgement of its participation in the celebrity culture um, through the notion of, of moral responsibility in the sense that they expect um, celebrities to be sort of role models for children. Like that's sort of a discourse that is going around. At the exact moment they do something morally questionable, which is to say, I don't know, um, I was thinking of you know Cardi B getting pregnant out of wedlock. Oh. Uh, or just right. or out just, of wedlock. Just, just, <laughs> no, I mean, they were married. I know. I mean, it's just like a term uh, from I don't know um, when. It's or, 2018. Or, or Donald Trump saying the talking about women the, the way he talks about women. And I was thinking of Kanye West that is a more controversial example. So, was, but I was thinking, so who gets a pass there as well? The idea. Of, so on the one hand, we criticize them or for the public expects them to be role models, so at those moments they criticize them or cancel them, mm -hmm. but we still consume their products. Kanye still has the best-selling album. So I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about the idea of responsibility that the public um, thrusts upon in mm -hmm. celebrities. So a lot of, so including in the work of Joseph Roach that I've cited, but in a lot of other of the most widely cited books on celebrity, like David Marshall, Celebrity and Power, Richard Dyer, Stars, that's long been observed, even past when structuralism was a primary mode of thinking, that celebrity culture is really organized around contradictions. So the, f the first answer I would give to what you're saying is that, yes, there's a sense in which stars are expected to be responsible role models, and at the same time, it has long been the case that there's not the same kind of moralized expectation, but certainly in practice, there's been huge rewards given to celebrities who defy norms. Very, Oscar Wilde is a good example. Sarah Bernhardt, I, I didn't really foreground that aspect of her persona in this talk, but there's a whole chapter about that. Marlon Brando, the, the people that you just cited, whose defiance of norms is what makes them cele cele celebrities and in that sense celebrated. So, one answer to that would be that we don't just want to follow rules. We want people to tell us that breaking rules is OK. And then I think it is important to remember that as a phenomenon, celebrity culture is defined by its, contra its just contradictory nature. So for every person who wants a celebrity to be a role model, there's someone else who's part of making them a celebrity who likes that they're not, but also the same person who wants one celebrity to be a role model and is mad about something will give an, another celebrity a pass. I don't think it would take me more than five minutes to find someone who's like, what Donald Trump does is okay, but I don't like what Cardi B is doing, and to find someone who's like, I love Cardi B, but Donald Trump, that's not right. So it's a space where people are allowed, encouraged, enabled to be irrational. I mean, in that sense, I would agree with Adorno that mass culture is not operating on a principle of rationality. Where I may disagree is it's not really a problem so long as it doesn't spill over into other areas, but of course it often does. Jenny, could you um, I had a couple of questions, so I'll just stick with you two. Um, one, in your introduction, you say that what you like to do in a way is talk back to critics of imitators as something that's not um, positive. And then in your talk, you focused a lot on criticisms, sort of criticize the criticisms. But I'm wondering where that moment of discussing imitation as, for example, transformative and creative um, in an act of its own, um, because I mean, the theory generally would always already accept that they will fail at being that other person. They're doing something through the transformation of themselves. For example, the wild imitators might also be taking on that critique of hegemonic masculinity through the imitation of wild celebrity. Um, number two, because of my interest in the sort of transformative act of uh, imitation. Um, I noted that a lot of the, <laughs> the scholars that you're talking back to are critical theorists outside of Jenkins, and I'm wondering why you made that choice, because critical theorists do tend to be 
more negative than say people in fans fan studies towards fans and amateurs. So I'm just curious. So I'll start with the second question. So in a I guess annoying, but it's just true. In another chapter, I talk at length about Jenkins's sort of rehabilitation of fans and the form of a and actually it answers your first question too. The form of agency, so to rehabilitate fans, you have to see them as agents. And to see them as agents, he decides that they are authors. And though he uses um, the work of Michel de Sorteau and, and claims that his you know, model of authorship is maybe not the typical one, in fact, when you look at the fans that he privileges when he studies them, they're producing elaborate, freestanding, works of art, these are not typical fans. <laughs> and I, I think that part of what I'm, so one of the reasons that I don't focus a lot on acts of imitation is that unlike Henry Jenkins, I'm studying the 19th century and I don't have a lot of material that is made by the imitators. So, you know, I, if I had found it, I would have been over the archival moon. But my access to imitators was more through people representing imitators. And they tended to be fairly censorious, although not in the fashion journals. But the, the ways that I would like to rehabilitate imitation, like Jenkins, I want to say that fans who imitate are exercising agency. But unlike Jenkins, I would like to start thinking about a more minimal kind of agency, uh, sort of maybe we could call it bare, barely there agency. And so I wouldn't necessarily want to say that the only thing that justifies um, imitation or that relieves imitation from the blistering critique directed at it is to say it's doing transformative work and challenging hegemonic notions. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's reinforcing hegemony and it's doing very, it's doing, well, it might be transformative work, but it's not transforming things for the better. Again, it, as I've just been saying over and over, it depends who you're imitating, why, to what end, and how. So, you know, agency when directed at an end that I and many others think is a bad end is not good agency, but it's still agency. But I do think that a lot of the forms of fan agency are not the, they, despite the reciprocity with the celebrity, as you point out, it's rare that the fans really attain the level of whatever it is they're imitating in the celebrity. I think, I mean, celebrities are celebrities in large part because they're, they, most of them are unusually gifted at the thing that they become celebrated for. So even if you're imitating a dance group, I mean, we're all, most, most fans are Henry James imitating Sarah Bernhardt. They're not achieving a much higher level <laughs> of, of skilled imitation than that. And so that's, I don't see that as a failure of agency though, I see that as a failure of skill. So I've, I still have not found a great, I'll be very honest and say, I haven't found a very good vocabulary that I'm happy with for trying to get at this sort of barely there agency that I'm talking about. But I have just tried to um, not, to, to resist the temptation to try to equate fans with either celebrities or with the kind of autonomous, fully in control, perfectly adept individual who produces autonomous works of art that are separate from them because that is not the only form of agency that should count. Mm -hmm. But there are reasons that we find it hard, that I find and I think others find it hard to recognize, talk about and describe these other forms of agency. They're harder to detect and they don't, you know, agency is just such a funny concept. I mean, there's so much work going on in animal studies in work by people like Jane Bennett to try to look at these, these minimal forms of agency in non-humans, but when we start trying to track it in humans, it seems to not count anymore. And so I, I look forward to that particular strand of problem as something that I'll keep thinking about and that might be easier to think about untethered from the celebrity fan relationship. Andrew? 
thanks for a great paper. Um, I've got two questions, um, which are kind of limitations to expand on, I guess, the examples that, that you use, or the, the Bernard example, but maybe to, to, to expand a bit more on, on the kind of theoretical implication. So the first would be, um, if you could say a little bit about the qualitative difference between a desire to imitate a type, which has a, perhaps a longer history before the 19th century, and the, the desire to imitate a celebrity who is perhaps the epitome of a type. So is, you know, is, are, are you suggesting that there's something in the 19th century um, that, that, that causes a, a switch? And maybe that has to do with, with who is able to imitate, which is, which is what you were saying. So mm. that's kind of an imitation. But the other one is, is perhaps more specifically with relation to Sarah Bernard, because I mean, what's really interesting, as you, as you said, is that she only performed in French. Mm -hmm. um, but you didn't say anything about her Frenchness or about the politics of being French and what that may have signified in that moment for a British audience or for an American audience. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd like to hear a bit more about that and perhaps if you could expand on that. Sure. How, how does national identity, uh, imperialism, mm -hmm. you know, and of course, you know, those type, national types can be racial types too, but how, how does that feature in your understanding of so are you suggesting that sort of pre nineteenth century there was an imitation of types that was completely untethered from the individual embodiment of that type? And can you just give me an no, example? I'm, 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 I'm thinking. I'm not challenging that. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a um, an historical sure. thing going on there. No, no, and this is just I mean, it's unclear to me. But I, I I'm thinking about eighteenth century aristocratic mm -hmm. crazes of imitating peasants. For example, mm -hmm. you know. okay, got it. So that's a very yeah, good example. Okay, right. so yes, I do think something switches. I think something switches when um, celebrity starts to become communicated in very, not only through text and lithographs but through photography. Because one of it took me a long time to figure out. I mean, there's so many ways that it's obvious that photography is really important to the rise of celebrity, but celebrity definitely predated the rise of photography. So I was trying to figure out exactly what I thought photography had done to change things, and I spent a lot of time looking at 18th century, especially late 18th century and early 19th century images of actors, politicians, you know, the, the people called celebrities in the 19th century were not at all primarily entertainers. If you look at books that have celebrities in the title, it's Abraham Lincoln, it's Charles Dickens, it's, you know, just well-known people, mostly men. So I, I looked at that kind of material, but I was also, just because actors were a sort of constant in the celebrity pantheon, even if they weren't always the typical celebrities I was comparing. And what was really striking to me was that, yes, there was a proliferation of images of actors before the rise of photography. Less the people who have done the work that allowed me to see that the numbers were very large of images that were circulating, the costs got lower and lower. But what was very striking is that I could look at 10 different lithographs and paintings of Sarah Siddons, one of the most famous actresses in England in the late 18th century. She never looked the same from one to the next. Mm -hmm. So people were really into Sarah Siddons and they collected these images, but if you were going to imitate her, it was very hard for Sarah Siddons, the individual, to coalesce with Sarah Siddons a type because a type requires that there be a replication of the same traits over and over again rapidly and easily. Well, that's what photography allows. People who want to look really different in photographs from one photograph to the next certainly can do that, but it takes an effort. If you look at photographs of Sarah Bernhardt that were circulating when she comes to the United States, some photographer named Napoleon Cerrone took about 10 photographs of her. She's in different costumes in each one, She's even, there. usually she's in a role, so sometimes she's trying to convey different traits, but the fact remains you can really recognize that the person in each photograph is the same person. And so I think with the rise of photography, individuals can embody types that are the type of that individual more easily. And maybe a better example is the Marlon Brando type, right? We all know what that is. Even though Marlon Brando is someone who eventually became known for being remarkably different from a girl to the next, changing his physical appearance a lot over time, but 
because of the indexical qualities of photographs, there's Marlon Brando type. What's it a type of? Well, I could say defiance, braggadocio, but it's also Marlon Brando. There's, you become a tautology, and that's where the individual and the type coalesce. So does that mean that people no longer represent some larger kind of type, like the French one? No, but it also means that there's some room between the two. So certainly when Bernhardt was in London, one of the reasons she's of such interest in the fashion magazines is because France was the source of fashion at the time, still kind of is, a little less so for England and the United States. And so people are finding a very easy time being interested in her clothing and her fashions and selecting that as something they'll imitate, not only because it's relatively easy to do so, but because she's French and there's a link to Frenchness. She, people, in writing about her, usually say she is the essence of the French woman. Actually, in her case, no. They like to see her as a representative or an ambassador of France, but in part because she was well known to be Jewish, and in part because her persona, her signature traits, her version of being Marlon Brando was eccentricity, willfulness, a kind of hyper individuality. She was never going to try. I think she deliberately didn't want to be reduced to the French woman. But her Frenchness always traveled with her. Her Jewishness always traveled with her. So I think that the relationship of the tech to an individual, it becomes more complex with the rise of this great in 19th century celebrity culture with photography. Patricia? Um, thank you so much, um, Sharon, for your talk. So um, you gave me so many things to think about. Um, I'm an avid of gossip blogs, so <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> uh, to give you a lot to think about. Um, sorry. Um, so uh, I was really interested um, how you were describing um, uh, Simon Bernhardt's exit. It reminded me of the very famous um, exit that happened recently on the latest season of RuPaul's Drag Race, mm -hmm. um, with Maggie's exit. For those of you who might know the famous exit, um, which I think is going to lead me to my next um, question or maybe just reflection. So um, I'm really interested in your argument about how sort of like this access to privilege, uh, access to imitation um, reinscribes a lot of ways of um, repressing people or dominating people um, who don't have that access. So um, in particular, the racial or the racism dimensions of that piece. So I was wondering if in your book you're going to um, explore uh, different um, ways of um, fugitivity or like um, maybe subversive acts that are found in spaces of invitation. Um, I was thinking of like in, um, in Paris is Burning, the documentary, how there's this whole very famous scene about, um, there's even like a depiction of like ads from like the 80s, like Vogue ads and fashion magazine ads. And so, um, so what I was thinking about that is sort of like the complexity of that sort of slip in imitation, uh, depending on like who's who, like minoritarian uses of imitation in particular, and then also like what we're seeing right now, again with like drag race, where there's like a whole flip of that initial subversion of access, you know, um, to um, like normal spaces, like that whole thing. Has been live now and so hyper um, commodified that now the people who actually win on drag race have like all this money are white mm -hmm. men. Um, so I was just wondering if you're going to or if you do that in your book like explore this sort of So this is the only chapter where I talk about imitation and other chapters are about there's one on multiplication, there's one on merit, there's one on judgment, there's one on sensation. There's um, there is a chapter where I again there's a lot of in that chapter I focus a lot on caricature. I mean, but I think my first answer is it sounds like you have a lot to say about this. Maybe mm -hmm. you should write <laughs> um, And the focus in the book is is not exclusively, but is fairly strongly on the 19th century, both as the moment when, um, the, the sort of post 1860s, 70s moment when I see modern celebrity culture really it coalescing in its modern form for the first time, and 
because the 19th century is what I know best, and so I decided to, since I was already extending myself into a lot of areas that weren't necessarily my specialization, I thought I would stick with the 19th century. But in a, it, there is one chapter where I look at how common a trope it was for journalists who often resent celebrities because they want to be the one telling the public what to think, and they don't like that celebrities are taking over that function and that they have to cover celebrities in order to reach readers. They would frequently represent Sarah Bernhardt's fans and public, especially in the United States, in visual imagery that draws on tropes of savagery. So there's a cartoon, a very elaborate cartoon that takes up two pages or about this wide that shows her going to the United States and her biggest fans are Native American tribes who then scalp all the senators because they want them to recognize Sarah Bernhardt as empress. And there is a lot, um, I mean, the term fugitivity I know has a lot of very specific meanings in theory, but there is a lot of emphasis in that cartoon, both in terms of content, but also the ways it, the, the, the loose lines are being drawn on people just moving out of control. There's always a lot of perception and movement, the vapors and smoke, and there's a sense of, there's the United States, first of all, is a place where there's just too much movement, and where people who should be contained, groups of people who should be contained, Mormon women are also among the group that rebels under the aegis of Sarah Bernhardt and join forces with her. Groups that should be contained are not being contained. And some of it, to return to the question about populism, is the vision of democracy run amok. And this is 1880, and democracy is then, it's now a highly contested term. And I think that the contestation around democracy is often linked to who's in their proper place. And fugitivity, of course, is the notion of people, you know, the fugitive is just a person moving from one place to another, but they're not supposed to have that mobility, so they're being defined as a fugitive. Maybe we'll take like two more questions, so we'll go here and here, if that's good. Um, yeah, I think that was really fascinating. Thanks for especially new ideas and new concepts even for thinking about this. I was wondering about, I guess, imitation um, of style, or um, specifically literary imitation. Um, I know that's kind of amorphous, but you know, one, one place where I would go where we're talking about not just types, but actual people is the 19th century phenomenon of like post-mortem publications. So where people claim to be like channeling the spirit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of Oscar Wilde, I think mm -hmm. was one of the big ones. Um, I think like there was a, a book published in 19, in the 1920s that um, the author claimed was Oscar Wilde's last you know, work um, channeled after, after his death. Um, so how does that kind of more, I guess, um, psychological, um, psychical paradigm of imitation fit into the kind of, um, you know, consumer culture in which it was also, you know, very much a part because these, you know, books were being published and, and marketed as, you know, um, with the um, kind of cachet of, of the deceased author as, you know, the, the primary incentive to, to purchase. Um, kind of oh, that's really interesting. I would, I, in this discussion, I was trying to focus on very, I'll call them even banal forms of imitation that large numbers of people either were or were being said to engage in. And I think what you're pointing to, you know, it existed as a phenomenon. It's not a one-off phenomenon, but it's, it's relatively rare. But I think that the, it also, what the specific examples you're giving point to a desire for intimacy with the celebrity and also, an envy that takes the form of appropriation. I mean, you know, in this case, appropriating someone's voice, their name, claiming to publish something. I, there's also, I have noticed, a tendency, especially, I think it's probably still the case, but it's really noticeable in the 19th and early 20th centuries that as soon as a celebrity dies, it becomes possible to say all kinds of things about them you couldn't say while they were alive or attribute all kinds of things to them that you couldn't while they were alive because they can't sue you anymore. They're dead. So, you know, Sarah Bernhardt dies in 1923. There's a series of very sort of spurious, weird, you know, crazy publications that come out in the next two to three years. And 
people now often tend to cite them because they say, like, oh, who's here? here's who she really had affairs with, and here's what was really happening when that negative <laughs> review came out. But I look at the publication date, and I think, yeah, well, it's an interesting index of the kinds of fantasies that this author had and that this author thought the public had about the figure. But it's, um, you know, so I guess that would be part of the way I would approach texts like these. We know that Oscar Wilde didn't write them and that the person didn't really channel Oscar Wilde. But in a world where reader response is a scarce thing, they provide a really interesting window onto what people thought could plausibly be associated with Wilde's name or what people thought his style was. Great, our last question, yeah. Um, I was curious about the way in which class works with uh, the ability to imitate. And I think the most popular modern example is the Kate Middleton effect, where anything she wears gets sold out. And so she figured it out, apparently, and now tries to shop high street so more people can afford the thing that she wears. Mm -hmm. But that's a 200-pound dress, which immediately excludes a large part of the public. So mm -hmm. there's a way in which this kind of imitation really selects for class. You were talking about foreign art and the gloves and the dresses mm -hmm. and everything else. I'm wondering, in addition to race, nationality, um, and other forms of otherness, there's also a critique of class or whether there's something going on with, you know, class mobility or class consciousness. Well, I think what you're pointing to is the way that the, the class element of this is so endemic that it doesn't even get remarked upon. <laughs> so even the people who are imitating her clothes, they were sewing them themselves, but to, to do that, they weren't necessarily buying them, but to do that, and they weren't necessarily hiring other people to sew them. The fashion magazine, I cut out some of the fashion material to, I didn't think it would necessarily be as interesting, but the, um, the fashion magazines would print patterns, huge patterns that would unfold, so a real sewing pattern, but even that required an incredible set of research. You would have to be middle class to be able to sew your own clothes. Most working class people in the 1870s and 1880s are just buying secondhand clothes that are being sold on the streets or in certain, on, you know, by peddlers or in certain markets. And so they still, perhaps, there might have been people who selected something because it reminded them of Sarah Bernhardt. And Sarah Bernhardt performed at a number of venues, some of which were extremely working class and orientation later in her life. So she did a vaudeville uh, tour of the vaudeville circuit in 1910. She performed in music halls in London in the first decade of the 19th century, partly to expand her audience, I think, at a point where she was, she was in her 60s and 70s. She, she needed to expand her audience to keep having one. And she did. She succeeded in doing that. So I, I think also film starts to make the imitation of celebrities available to a much broader group of classes and not exclusively to the middle classes and elites. But I think you're making a really important point that, that class doesn't figure so much in these parodies because it wasn't really possible for working class people to imitate in the ways that are being charted here, for example, through clothing or commodities. Can I just ask a quick follow-up? Yeah, okay. I can see. <laughs> no, just very Sorry. quick because I wonder, you know, I, the thing, like the gloves thing actually made me think about when my sister was like wearing fingerless gloves mm -hmm. after Madonna or mm -hmm. just like the Michael Jackson like one glove. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't take a lot of money actually to do these little sort of partial um, indicators of that, so is that, I mean, do you, do you Well, yes, but if we also think back to in this particular moment in the images that we saw, how much a signifier of, of the working class status of the figure, the figures depicted as black is that they're wearing short sleeves, they don't wear gloves, they don't, I don't know what the deal is with the no shoes because, it, it, you know, some of that seems sort of invidious, but I think that actually now gloves don't requ require mm -hmm. a lot to imitate, but that then gloves were a signifier of class, and mm -hmm. you wouldn't wear any kind of glove mm -hmm. if you were a working class woman. And when I think to the photographs of Hannah Mumby, uh, Hannah Colwick that Arthur Mumby took, famous Victorian photographs where he dressed her up in all kinds of guises, including in blackface, and those are a good example of how you can use photography to look different in each photograph. The signifiers of work are, clothing, bare arms, bare hands. Um, and you know, 
I'm not a social historian, but from what I know of people's income and from what these commodities cost, I do think that even buying a newspaper or a magazine and even literacy, a lot of these things were outside the, uh, the means of working class people. What would not have always been outside the means of working class people were the photographs. And so, who, you know, I don't know how much people could imitate the photographs, but they could certainly possess the photograph. And, and in Bleak House, there's a famous scene where a young man, not the lumpen proletariat of Joe, but like a young working class man, has an image of Lady Dedlock that he got from a magazine posted on his wall. So the images were circulating. And I shouldn't presume that people who were working class couldn't engage in some kind of imitation. I think you know, with the music hall culture, there was a lot of imitation of catchphrases, which we see a lot with TV today. You know, all of a sudden, everyone's saying it is what it is. I don't even know what show it came from. But I would bet dollars to donuts it came from a TV show. And that was happening in music hall culture. But those were performers who, unlike Sarah Bernhardt, presented themselves more as of the working class. So some of this is a function of my example. I picked an example who was not herself born wealthy. She was born illegitimate to a woman who was a courtesan. But um, she certainly, her, her class connotations were kind of aristocratic, nouveau riche, not, yeah, anybody can do this at home. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>